Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So, we have a special episode here today, as you guys may have guessed from the title. Uh, just before we start, guys, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, and then, of course, check out the website, eigenbros.com, eigenbros on Instagram, eigenbros on Twitter, eigenbros2 on TikTok. And thank you guys once again, the patrons. We greatly appreciate it. Um, you guys have been here to support the channel, and you guys keep supporting. We greatly appreciate your help. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to join Patreon as well, just check out patreon.com slash eigenbros, and we do a 30-minute podcast extra there every week. And uh, yeah, let's begin. So yeah, and and thank you to Jonathan once yes. more for coming on the show. Of course. Yeah. But first, let's of course give him a proper introduction. So, yes. uh, of course, our guest here today he is a researcher at Cambridge. Um, I'm sure you guys guys recognize him from the Wolfram Physics Project. Uh, he is the of course the co-founder of the Wolfram Physics Project as well as the associate director of research. Um, and yeah, without further ado, Jonathan Gerard. Yeah. Hi. Well, thanks very much for having me on again. Um, I apologize to uh, to Terence and Juan for the fact that we, we we were trying to schedule this months ago, and then we kept having scheduling conflicts and things. So uh, I'm really glad that we finally managed to, to find a time to make this work because it was it was so much fun to be on here last time, and I'm I'm really happy to be on again. Well, uh, the audience was clamoring for you, Jonathan. So we're glad to have you back too, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool. So yes. Yeah, so okay. Yeah, so let's jump right in, Jonathan. So I guess uh, just to recap, um, if you guys didn't check it out already, um, of course, check out the first iteration of this podcast, I guess you could say part one uh, with Jonathan. We did on episode 117. Uh, we talked about a nice, you know, nice bunch of stuff there. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a recap. So, Jonathan, you could just expound um, as I kind of bring up these things. So, you guys mentioned last time, or you mentioned last time that, you know, Wolfram kind of distinguishes itself from a lot of different frameworks um, of physics, I guess you could say, in the sense that um, you start with this discretized space. So, I thought that was a really interesting um, part of the uh, project. And I guess. Um, has anything changed since then, or did you guys have anything more illuminating um, in regards to that discretized space? And I guess just give a, a couple points about that and why that is so um, different compared to uh, other theories, maybe. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, maybe let me tr let me try a slightly different perspective to the one that I mentioned kind of the, the first time around, which is so wh why is it natural to think about space and time as being discrete? Um, so there's been suspicion for a while that something weird happens at around the Planck scale, right? So there's this fundamental scale in, in, in physics, which is the Planck scale, so that there is a Planck length, a Planck time, a Planck energy, a Planck mass, etc. And the, really the significance of, for instance, the Planck length is that it's the length scale over which uh, relativistic effects and quantum mechanical effects start to become comparable. So generally speaking, we think, you know, Relativity, GR, that applies at kind of large scales for large mass displacements. Quantum mechanics, that applies at small scales for small mass displacements. And then, and so as you go to smaller scales, relativity becomes less and less relevant. Quantum mechanics becomes more and more relevant. And there comes a point where effectively these two curves cross and the two effects become of comparable scale. And that, that scale is the Planck scale. And so uh, the reason why that's kind of interesting is because it means that to, to really describe the physics of what's happening at the Planck scale, you need a, a theory of quantum gravity, which of course we don't have. And so for a long time, people, physicists have kind of suspected that our continuum description of space and time pr may well break down. We don't know that it breaks down, but but there's a, there's, a, there's a pretty strong heuristic argument for believing that it breaks down at or approaching uh, the, you know, the, the, this kind of Planck scale. And so one obvious thing to replace it with is a more is effectively a quantized version of space-time, a quantum mechanical version of space-time, or in other words, a discrete version of space-time. And so that immediately motivates a kind of, a, 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 or gives an immediate motivation for thinking about space-time in a discrete way. Relatedly, um, it's been known, for, okay, so you, okay. One question you might ask is, why is it so hard to devise a theory of quantum gravity? Why is it so difficult to make gravity work with the other fundamental forces? There are a few different ways you can think about it. One is that the fact that the gauge group of, gravity, the Poincare group, is so different to the gauge groups of the other fundamental forces. It does, it's not unitary, it doesn't have unitary representations and all these kinds of things. Um, but there's actually a more direct way that you can see that if you think about path integrals in quantum field theory. So suppose I, I try to write down a path integral for uh, the gravitational action in quantum field theory. 
Uh, you can do that. That's fine. Okay, I, I, I can I can write down a path integral. Everything looks perfectly reasonable. Now let's imagine I try to actually compute some amplitudes using that path integral. Uh, it turns out something happens there which doesn't happen for any of the fundamental forces. So so ordinarily, as you go to higher energy scales, uh, so in, 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 or you know to shorter length scales, the contributions to your path integral and, the, and therefore to your action go down. And this is kind of important because that, that's the thing that ensures that the uh, you know that the path integral actually converges and you get a finite answer and you can compute scattering amplitudes that have sensible values and those kinds of things. And so that's kind of what that's the approach that's been used in other fundamental forces. And in cases where that doesn't happen, there's this trick that you can use called renormalization that lets you essentially get rid of inf these divergences in such a way that you, the, the answer you end up with is still finite. With gravity, that doesn't occur. Gravity has what's called an ultraviolet divergence, which means that as you go to shorter length scales, as you, in other words, as you go to sort of towards the ultraviolet end of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the contributions to the path integral get larger and larger, not smaller and smaller, and so uh, it, and so you end up with this this what we might call an unrenormalizable infinity, this infinity that you can't get rid of by standard mathematical techniques. And so your path integral just doesn't make any sense. You're, the, if you try to write down a naive quantum field theory for gravity, it doesn't work. So a question is, how do, how can you avoid that problem? Well, you know, string theory gives you one approach to avoiding the problem by sort of, uh, you know, saying that gravitons sort of exist inside these kind of closed loops of string that that, that, that sort of produce these extended uh, sort of um, higher dimensional world world sheets. Um, but there's a, a actually a much more direct approach, which is that you could say, well, this ultraviolet divergence only happens because you can go to arbitrarily short length scales because you know as as you sum all possible length scales down to zero. You know the contributions to the integral get larger and larger, but if you say, well, maybe that maybe you can't do that. Maybe there's a, maybe there is a shortest length scale, uh, and then and then everything below that doesn't. You know, there there there, are, there aren't any contributions to the path integral below that scale. Then immediately you get what's called a lattice regularization. You get a, a, an ultraviolet cutoff for your path integral, which means that beyond that you know beyond that energy scale beyond that level below that length scale there are no more contributions so suddenly your 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 action becomes finite and your your quantum field theory for gravity becomes renormalizable and that so th this process called lattice regularization is a very very again a very direct way to see why a, a discrete model of space time is much more conducive to quantum gravity than a continuous model of space time so other people have kind of developed techniques like i mean so so causal dynamical triangulation causal set theory loop quantum gravity, all of these approaches to an extent make use of the fact that you have this lattice regularization where if you postulate a discrete space time, suddenly quantum gravity becomes so much easier to, to, to do. So, but, you know, in effect, the, the thing that's different with the Wolfram model from all of these other approaches is that to some extent with all these other approaches, the, the mathematical formalism starts from something continuous and then tries to discretize it. So with causal dynamical triangulation, you start from a continuous space time and then you produce a triangulation that makes it discrete. Or with causal set theory, you start from a continuous space time and you do this procedure called sprinkling that makes it discrete um, and so on. Whereas with the Wolfram model, we're, we're effectively going in the other direction. We're saying, let's start with something discrete and see if we can build up to the continuum. And, uh, and and effectively, a lot of, most of the hard work that we've been doing has been trying to figure out how you derive, you know, continuum physics from underlying kind of discrete dynamics. Uh, that would be, that's my first attempt at, at that. That's a really interesting answer. Uh, it's a lot to unpack too. I really want to kind of come back to that lattice regularization uh, at some point again, uh, but maybe not now. Um, well, that that also that approach also seems more intuitive to me. Right, right, I guess that's probably why uh, Wolfram's project is trying to do it that way. Um, it's like that kind of matches reality more so, right? You want to start from discretized to continuous. Like I was thinking water molecules. Water molecules are, you know, they're just, well, they're sort of these discrete objects. And then uh -huh. when they get closer together, you get this more continuum sure. behavior of water. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. I, I just find that you, the approach that y'all are taking is much more... Um, intuitive to me as opposed to going backwards but yeah so um i guess the next point i wanted to touch on from the last video also jonathan was the dimensionality so there was a little bit of um i had a lot of there were a lot of questions regarding the um dimensionality and how storage dimensions and whatnot and how they kind of linked up with uh you know of course with um the real dimensions of, of space as we know it and you know in the actual universe um, I couldn't really decode some of the questions, though, so I don't know if I want to ask any of them directly, but I guess I'll just give you another opportunity to kind of expound upon, you know, the connection between Hausdorff's dimensions and then, you know, of course, 
the normal dimensions as we know the inter the integer dimensions of reality. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, I mean, actually, I should mention, um, I, at some, if there are a lot of questions about this, I'm happy to go into the YouTube comments and actually answer people. Direct. I didn't realize that there were comments about this topic in particular, but if, if, there, if there are, I'm happy to go in and answer them, uh, answer people directly in the comments after this. Um, okay. So, so just a quick recap of, of the notions of dimension. So for most, you know, nice spaces that you encounter in physics or in, in mathematics, um, you know, for, 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 in particular for manifold structures, uh, there are various notions of dimension and they all happen to coincide. That's kind of what makes the spaces nice. So the intuitive notion of dimension that we all kind of know about is what's often called topological dimension, which is essentially the one way you can describe it is it's the minimum size of the spanning set of vectors for a particular space. You know, if you think of your space as a vector space. So in other words, you're, you're, you're effectively asking how many different, you know, orthogonal perpendicular directions are there in your space. And obviously by definition, that's always an integer. Um, an alternative notion of dimension is what's called Hausdorff dimension, and you can think of that as being essentially a statement about the scaling relations of objects in that space. So uh, one feature of one-dimensional space is if you have a one-dimensional object like a line and you scale it up by a factor of two, its length increases by two, by a factor of two. If you have a two-dimensional space and you have a two-dimensional object like a square and you scale it up by a factor of two, its area increases by a factor of four. Um, and so in general, in D dimensions, the kind of the, the, the volume enclosed by an object in, in, in dimension D will scale like the radius to the power D. Um, so in particular, so if you look at a, a ball of radius R, it's, it's you know, the, the leading order term in its growth will always be R to the power D for, for some dimension D. But of course, we know that you can have non-integer exponents. And so there exist spaces where the topological dimension and the Hausdorff dimension are different and where the Hausdorff dimension actually has some fractional value. And those spaces are often called fractals. So what one, one definition of a fractal um, is that it's a, it's any space where the Hausdorff dimension is strictly larger than its topological dimension. So all the kind of, all the things like the Mandelbrot set or the, you know, the, the Sapinski gasket or the, the Koch curve, all these kind of famous self-similar fractals all have this property that the Hausdorff dimension is kind of weird and often not an integer. So when you build up spaces um, from sort of discrete data, so if you try and if you try and construct a graph or a network that approximates like a manifold or a, 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 a continuous space, very often it will not have a nice integer value of its Hausdorff dimension. Um, and so, you, in a sense, if you want to reproduce, as far as we know, our universe, you know, our, or space time is a manifold or is very, very close to a manifold. So in a sense, what you want is a is a network which which limits to something which has, you know, on average, more or less integer dimension, integer Hausdorff dimension. But there's nothing to stop it maybe having pockets where the Hausdorff dimension increases a bit or decreases a bit where there's slight fractal kind of behavior in, in, in the way that it's structured. And in fact, at some level, you that it, it's very hard locally to distinguish between dimension and curvature. Um, okay, so sorry, it's a slightly cryptic comment. Let me explain that a little bit. So if you don't know, like a priori, what the dimension of the space is, then all you can do is look at the volumes of stuff, right? So you can, you can look at, uh, if I, I can look at the volume of a, of a ball around a point in, in a network by just picking a vertex and then looking at the vertices adjacent to that vertex and the vertices adjacent to those and growing out something of, of some discrete radius R. And I can look at how that scales and I can use that to infer the, the exponent in the, in the scaling relation. Um, but if the network is approximating a space that's curved, then there's also a second order correction term that's proportional to the curvature. So the first order term is, is you know, R to the power D, is, that's related to the dimension. Then there's a, a second, there's a, um, a quadratic correction term that's basically equal to the Ricci scalar, which is a, a, a measure of curvature, times, uh, R, times R to the two, um, or, you know, or multiply by R to the D. So uh, if you want to extract curvature information, what you essentially have to do is you have to make some assumption about what the dimension is and then extract what the second order correction term is. And that, that gives you a way of, of computing curvature. But of course, in general, as I say, you don't know, you, you, if you just have a network, you don't know what its dimension is and you don't, you don't know what its curvature is. And so locally, a small change in dimension can look very much like a large change in curvature or vice versa. Essentially, and, and the reason for that is basically the fact that when you look at a small scale, it's hard to distinguish what is a, a, a high degree polynomial from an exponential. You know, like a, a high degree polynomial ba basically looks like an exponential unless you can see a large part of it. Um, and so, uh, so what that means is that 
there's a kind of in our model we have a slightly more general formulation of general relativity where not just where curvature doesn't just vary but also dimension can vary and in fact even more complicated there are all of these cross terms because you know d uh, d perturbations in dimension also produce perturbations in curvature and vice versa so we have a slightly more general formulation of gravity that incorporates uh, effects that in ordinary mathematical GR you might call non-metricity effects, um, but for us effectively manifest as, as, as perturbations in dimension. Uh, there's a lot more to say, but let me not <laughs> talk forever about that. Wow, that's pretty interesting, man. You're saying something more general than general relativity? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Right. Well, so... Uh-huh. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, I mean, it's a good point that you make, Juan. So, so it's it, it's important to note that in some sense we've known for a while that the Einstein equations of general relativity aren't the most general formulation of, of gravity. Mm -hmm. um, so when you derive GR, when you derive the Einstein field equations, for instance, you impose this thing called the called the Levi-Civita connection or the metric connection. And um, the, the, that's the thing that gives you the sort of the Christoffel symbols for, you know, for, with which you can define the Riemann tensor and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the Levi-Civita connection is just an assumption. It's an assumption, uh, namely, it's, it's encoding the assumption that your metric is what's called torsion-free, or your, your, your space-time is torsion-free. And loosely speaking, torsion-free just means that uh, if you go from A to B, it's the same distance as if you go from B to A. So torsion is, is a... Is a concept in differential geometry that's measuring the discrepancy between the distance from A to B and the distance from B to A. So when you impose the metric connection, you're assuming that there's zero torsion. We have no reason physically to assume that that's true in our universe. We just assume it for mathematical consistency. And you get the Einstein field equations. But there's a more general formulation uh, that incorporates not just the curvature tensors, but also this thing called the contorsion tensor, which is a version of GR that includes torsion. And that's a more general version of gravity. There's a yet more general version of gravity that includes what's called non-metricity. And, and what we're defining effectively is, is one level of generality above that. So as I say, we, we've, we've known for at least, you know, for, for close to 100 years, there are more general formulations of gravity that actually get used in, uh, I mean, there are things like Haraba Lifshitz gravity and other kind of quantum gravity models that use these more general formulations of the field equations. And ours just happens to be another yet more general formulation where there's also, uh, you know, the, the possibility for, for dimension change in your space. Sorry, I, I interrupted you, but I just, that's a point that's worth making. Yeah, pretty interesting. So that so that generality would be considered a quantum gravi gravity uh, generalization, then. Yes. Yes. Exa exactly. Exactly. Um, it, it's it's a it's a level of generality you don't really get unless you have something that's unless your space is underlying you know it, it is quantized effectively. It, it, you know it, you, you have to have something like a discrete structure to get something like that. I see. I see. Okay. Cool. Um, did you remember anything else from the uh, first video that we should have touched upon just real quick before we move on to kind of I some mean, of the newer stuff? I mean, yeah, but I mean, I, I'll probably I'll try to find natural points at which I can interject them. But OK, I, yeah, I did have some follow up questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to fit them in wherever they fit the most. Naturally. Yeah, yeah. OK, cool. I just wanted to give a little bit of some more, you know detail from the first video but mm -hmm. let's move on because we didn't actually get to um touch on some things well i guess just uh a, an opportunity for you to kind of talk about some of the new things or where you guys are at in the wolfram project uh jonathan because you know i know wolfram gave uh, a video kind of regarding this um you know i guess now probably a week ago when this podcast comes out um and uh, he just was kind of you know, talking about some of the new things that you guys have been doing, you know, where the uh, project is at currently. So I guess I'd like to give you an opportunity, Jonathan, to kind of, you know, give some more detail on that. Um, yeah. Sure, sure, no problem. Okay, so my, my answer will necessarily be a little bit biased because I, I generally tend to be more excited about the things that I'm directly involved in, but I'll try, I'll try and give an overview. Um, okay, so yeah, several things have happened since we last spoke, I think in, in May. Um, so one is that uh, okay. Let me let me talk about some very practical things, and then and then some of the more theoretical stuff. So already the um, some of the formalism we've we've been developing has is already starting to have kind of sort of quote unquote practical applications. So one of these is in is in quantum computing. So we we've been developing a kind of big uh, software package for Mathematica for doing kind of quantum computations and simulating quantum algorithms. And one of the remarkable things is that the multi-way system formalism, which is kind of our way of thinking about quantum mechanics and quantum processes in the context of the Wolfram model, gives you a bunch of new algorithmic techniques for doing things like circuit simplification for quantum computers. So 
This is a, a fairly general kind of problem that people care about in quantum information theory. So you, you're given a quantum circuit, some specification of a quantum algorithm, and you say, let me, I, I want to simplify this circuit, for instance, by uh, reducing the number of you know, T gates or by reducing, t taking some Clifford circuit and reducing it to a pseudo normal form, which where it only has you know, a, a, a particular gate structure or something. And this is very important when you're, when you're actually doing kind of experimental quantum computing because you're, you're, you know, the, 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 the quantum computer that you have inside your cryostat will have definite physical constraints. And so you have to reduce your algorithm to a description that it's actually able to kind of reproduce. And uh, our multi-way system framework gives you a very, very efficient uh, technique for doing effectively automated circuit optimization by exploiting the causal structure that's inherent to the multi-way system. And that's something that was so, um, Myself, Monogna Namaduri, and Xuxi Zasawala, we published a paper, or we published actually a sequence of papers about this uh, several months ago, and we've been gradually turning that into actual like production grade software that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad to say now, kind of increasingly in use for doing actual practical you know, you know, quantum, uh, qu quantum computation optimization. Um, there's also another practical direction, which I'm not so directly involved in, but which Stephen has been very excited about, which I think, uh, Terrence, you, you brought up, I, I think, before we started recording, which is this, this multi-computation paradigm. And this is another way that multi, the, the way of thinking about quantum mechanics that we get from the model, multi-way systems, uh, turns out to be useful for fairly practical programming stuff. So uh, ordinarily, when you have a you know, computer programming language, there's always a, a, you know, there's always a definite state of your, of your program at every kind of intermediate step of execution, right? You, you, you start with some definite input, it undergoes some computation. At every, at every point, there's a definite state of all the variables, all the memory locations, and at the end, you produce some output. With a multi-way system, though, you have something quite different. What you have is a set of possible inputs, um, and effectively like a sort of statistical ensemble of inputs. Then you have some multi-way system that, that computes and goes in all possible directions, performs you know, effectively the space of all possible computations on those inputs, and then produces a, a, a statistical ensemble of outputs. So if you think of classical you know, classical computational thinking as being like, you know, a bit like classical physics in the sense that you have, you know, just a single definite trajectory for your system, multi-way systems give you something that's more like a sort of uh, a path integral approach to thinking about computer programming. And so an obvious question is, how do we design a programming language that supports multi-computation, that, you know, that, that supports the specification of these kind of uh, more or less quantum mechanical uh, intermediate program states. It's actually a really complicated language design problem, which, as I say, I'm not directly involved in, but which Stephen has been kind of mounting an effort recently to try to to figure out how we can essentially design the the, the first, as far as we know, the first truly multi-computational programming language, um, which, as I say, will also have a bunch of resonances with ideas in quantum computing and and uh, also non-deterministic computing and other areas where where similar ideas have kind of arisen. So those are some practical application stuff that the the the, 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 the uh, so sorry some practical application things that have been happening recently, uh, but anyway so on the more theoretical side which in my opinion is is the more exciting part, um, okay so a few things have been happening um, one is. Uh, so I've been working with um, a former student of mine, Julia Dannemann Freitag, on effectively developing what are called axiomatic quantum field theories in the context of the Wolfram model. So we have a formulation already of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics, finite dimensional quantum mechanics, um, but which uses multi-way systems. But in effect, to get there, you're ignoring all the spatial structure. You're ignoring you know, everything, all the interesting geometrical details of the hypergraph, because, you know, quantum, ordinary non-relativistic quantum mechanics doesn't really have a notion of spatial structure. So a question is, if we, if we now go back and we include the spatial structure, can we get a relativistically invariant formulation of quantum mechanics? Can we get a quantum field theory? Um, and can we prove rigorously that the, the, the theory we get out is indeed a quantum field theory, just as we did for quantum mechanics? Well, it's much more complicated, and uh, it's partly hindered by the fact that there aren't very many mathematically rigorous formulations of quantum field theory anyway. Um, basically, there's um, there are axiomatic field theories which only work for free quantum scalar fields. There are what are called conformally invariant quantum field theories, and there are topologically invariant quantum field theories. And those are basically the only th three kinds that have been mathematically formalized completely. Everything else is kind of based on slightly rickety uh, mathematical foundations. So we've been doing the kind of simplest case of that, which is, an, which is a free axiomatic quantum field theory. So the idea is there that you take um, a multi-way system 
which you can think of as effectively being a multi-way system of possible space times, what we what we might call a causal multi-way system. So every every intermediate state is really a causal graph that represents the the whole causal history of space time. So when you traverse that multi-way system, what you're looking at is a is effectively a, an evolution of a superposition of possible space time states. And you can ask, okay, can we can we use that? So it's very tempting to conclude that that multi-way system should act a bit like a path integral, that you should be able to get something like a Feynman propagator from it. So an obvious question is, can we compute, say, transition amplitudes for, uh, you know, between space-time geometries using that multi-way system? Well, to do that, there's a lot of mathematical technology that has to be built, right? You effectively have to define, you have to have a way of, uh, you have to define a scalar field over your space-time, then you have to be able to extract things like Pauli-Jordan operators, Whiteman functions, you have to be able to define Green's functions, uh, and then from that you have to be able, you know, you have to be able to split them into the advanced and retarded Green's functions, from there you can construct a Feynman propagator, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of kind of intermediate steps. But we've been able to do at least the first non-trivial quantum field theoretic calculation using Wolfram model systems, which is a computation of what's called a space-time entanglement entropy. So what that means is, in a quantum gravity theory, when you treat space-time as a quantum mechanical structure, uh, you can compute things like, so entanglement entropies, which are a quantum mechanical concept that tell you sort of how strongly entangled two subsystems are, you can start to compute those over space-time. And so we have a, there's an approach to doing that for discrete space times that was developed by by causal set theory, where you take something like a causal graph and you kind of you construct say a diamond inside it as like a subgraph, a diamond shaped subgraph inside it that's like a subsystem that you're tracing over, and you can ask how strongly entangled is that subsystem with the rest of the space time, and that and then you can compute an entanglement entropy, and causal set theory gives you a way to do that, so we kind of know what the right answer is. Our, the branchial graphs that come from the Wolfram model, which are these graphs that you get by taking a multi-way system and slicing across it horizontally, those have a, a, a metric defined on them, uh, which we can sh prove in some cases limits to this thing called a fabini studi metric. And that fabini studi metric has the property that you can compute entanglement entropies using it. And that effectively, the, the further away two states are in the, in the branchial graph, the larger, uh, the, the, the larger the entanglement entropy between those microstates. And so what we've been able to do is both by doing some actual sort of rigorous mathematics and also by running some very, very large computer simulations on, on AWS, we were able to show that actually the entanglement entropies we compute using the path integrals from the Wolfram model using multi-way systems give you exactly the same answer as the path integrals that you would compute using standard causal set theoretic techniques. Um, so we've been able to, I mean, there's a lot there's a lot still to do, but we've been able to show that at least in, in, in a non-trivial case, we can define a quantum field theory for a Wolfram model, and we can compute, uh, you know, uh, effectively transition amplitudes on, on space-time that give you the right answers for things like entanglement entropies. That's very exciting, and there's a lot more to be done there. Um, another thing is there is also some some more purely mathematical stuff that we're doing. So, as for instance, I, uh, in collaboration with, with Xerxes Dasawala, who I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been working on... Um, trying to construct a, a kind of more mathematically abstract way of deriving continuous spaces from these discrete underlying models using things uh, using techniques that come from areas like topos theory and homotopy type theory um, I, it's probably not worth explaining in detail how that works but there's there's this very very abstract mathematical structure called an infinity groupoid um, which in in modern algebraic topology is kind of in some sense, is the most general way that you can think about what a topological space really is. And we've been working on trying to prove that, in fact, in, in limiting cases, our Wolfram model evolutions do produce in these infinity groupoids from which you can get essentially topological structure. Um, and relatedly, we've been trying to kind of use that new approach to thinking about these spaces, these you know the, 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 the transition between discrete and continuous spaces to try to derive essentially a more general version of analysis and a more general version of differential geometry. So you know ordinarily when you think about doing analysis or even when you think about doing topology, you're assuming you have a very nicely well-behaved space, which has you know a well-defined notion of, of dimension that's that's the same across topo topological and Hausdorff. And so a question is, what would a theory like topology or a theory like analysis look like in these more general spaces? Can you define things like open sets? Can you def and from that, can you define continuous functions? Can you define what it means to be differentiable or integrable on one of these spaces? It's actually quite complicated to do, but we, we, we're, we're starting to develop some of the mathematical foundation for thinking about that. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of, of stuff that we're working on from is a very, very practical kind of application stuff to very, very theoretical and mathematical stuff. Um, we, we, maybe we can talk about some of those things in more detail later. Excellent, man. That's a lot of uh, interesting things you guys have going on. I mean, the Wolfram 
it seems like the Wolfram model just has so many things that you can do with it. Um, yeah. It seems to be a powerful framework um, of working within. Yeah, I mean, it spans quantum from quantum stuff to right. relativity, you know. But I actually, I wanted to ask a follow-up question because um, you mentioned entanglement entropy, but I know that like loosely in quantum information that there's like a tie-in like between information and entanglement entropy. I, I don't know if you can speak more on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so, um, okay. I, I mentioned a bunch of words, um, <laughs> in, in the process of talking about that, but so maybe I can explain in a bit more detail what, what they, what they really are. So yeah, absolutely. Um, there's this, this thing, which I described as the, the Fubini study metric, which is the, as I say, which turns out to be the natural. So, um, the natural metric on something on a causal graph turns out to be a space-time metric tensor in, in in a large class of cases. But the natural metric instead on a branchial graph, when you take a multiway system and you slice it apart, turns out to be this Fubini Studi metric. And the Fubini Studi metric is directly related to what's called the Fisher information metric. And that is exactly a kind of information distance, uh, a classical information distance. But in a sense, you can think of it as being a sort of complexified version of, cl of classical information distance that you get from Fisher information. And, uh, th and then that complexified version is related to a bunch of standard quantum mechanical distance metrics, in particular, this thing called the quantum Burroughs metric. I think it's it's... I forget exactly which way around it goes, but it's related. The real part is related to four times the quantum Burroughs metric, or maybe the other way around. I, f I forget which way. But anyway, so so all of these ideas are indeed related, and so then uh, then there's a natural way from the Burroughs metric that you can compute an entanglement distance or an entanglement entropy. So yeah, you're exactly right. In effect, the 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 real part of the entanglement entropy uh, for a quantum system is directly related to a notion of classical information distance. And so, yeah, you're, you're exactly correct. There's a very close tie-in between classical information and, and effectively quantum entanglement entropies. And so in a sense, when we compute these entanglement entropies, entropies for space-time, you can think of them as being some kind of measure of how much information is being encoded in this particular region of space-time. Loosely. Very interesting. Pretty interesting. Um, so let's see. I guess, um, what was the other thing I want? Oh, so I guess... Yeah, you guys have a lot of interesting um, things going on in the Wolfram sphere right now. Um, I guess now we want to kind of take it back to a more fundamental level and um, kind of address some of the things that I wanted to address uh, last episode, but we were short on time. So I really want to understand the notion of particles, particularly, Jonathan, in this system, um, because, of course, you know, physicists, we like to keep it simple. <laughs> I gotta, you know, I want to understand more about like how do particles and mass um, actually manifest in this system, you know, of these hypergraphs. Like, where do those actually come in? And maybe you can just explain a little bit how they arise. Sure. Okay. So, um, well, let, let me begin with a confession, which is that you know, um, our formulation of of sort of particle physics in the context of these models is very, very embryonic. So almost everything we've done so far has been looking at essentially the large scale structure of space time, large scale geometry and quantum mechanical properties that can be computed from space time alone, like these entanglement entropies, for instance. And the reason why we've been focusing on that is, is precisely because we don't have a particularly robust formulation of particles yet. Um, you know, I would love to be able to sit here and say, you know, we found an electron in one of these systems, but, you know, I, I can't say that. Um, we have, uh, as I say, an embryonic formulation of how particles work, and um, we have toy examples where we can look at effectively, part you know, where we can look at particle interactions. And in principle, one might we might be able to get to the point where we can actually compute, you know, interaction cross sections and things for particle interactions, but that requires more work. Um, but okay, let me talk about the embryonic um, formulation we have. So, um, okay, I can make an analogy. Let's start with a simplified analogy. So. Um, if you have a, 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 a flat network, a flat undirected graph that's just you know embedded in a two-dimensional plane, there are some graphs which you can embed in a two-dimensional plane without any of the edges crossing over, and there are other graphs where you can't. And the, the graphs which you can embed are called planar graphs, and the graphs which you can't embed without edges crossing over are called non-planar graphs. And there's a famous theorem in graph theory which is called Kuratowski's theorem, um, and what it says... Uh, Okay, formally what it says is that every non-planar uh, graph has a subgraph that's isomorphic to a subdivision of either K5 or K33. What that means actually is, so K5 is 
if you think of a network or a graph which is just five points where every point is connected to every other point, that's that's called K5. And K33 is if you think of a, a, a network that consists of six points, uh, two groups of three, where every point in one group is connected to every point on the other group. Um, so you, you have, you know, Every 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 yeah every vertex in the in the in the first set is connected to the three vertices in the other set. So that's and that that graph is called K three three. And those both of those graphs are non planar. There's quite obviously there's no way you can write down uh, you there's no way you can draw the K five graph on five vertices without the edges crossing over in the middle. You just can't do it. Um, and what Kuratowski's theorem says is that basically every graph that is non planar, every graph that can't be embedded without vertex without edge crossing has a graph that's some variant of either K5 or K33 contained inside it. Um, OK, what does any of this have to do with particles? OK, well, so now imagine you had a, 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 a rule, like a Wolfram model rule, that you defined on a graph uh, which preserved planarity. So in other words, where the, the input subgraph is always planar and the output subgraph is always planar. So what that means is that if the graph you, if the initial graph you started with is planar, the other final graph you start, you end with is always going to be planar, no matter how how many times you apply the rule or in what order you apply the rule. So we might call that a planarity preserving rule. Okay. Now imagine you took a planar graph and you injected a subgraph that was either you know was isomorphic to either K5 or K33. So you just take one, you take K5 and you just put it in your network somewhere, or you take K33 and you just inject it in your network somewhere. Well, that non-planar tangle, if you like, that little non-planar subgraph, that's going to persist, right? You can't, that's not going to disappear because the rules that you've defined preserve planarity. So that non-planar subnetwork or subgraph is just going to bounce around and do, you know, do all kinds of stuff, but it's going to, it's going to persist. And the only way it could disappear is effectively if it kind of somehow interacted with another copy of itself. And so one thing you realize is that uh, if you have planarity preserving rules, subgraphs that are isomorphic to K5 or K33 will behave a bit like elementary particles. They will behave as, as persistent localized structures that just propagate throughout the network because of Kuratowski's theorem. OK, so there's now there's a much more general way to think about that, which is so. so um, K5 and K33 are just particular examples of what we might call um, topolo like t localized topological obstructions uh, it, th th that exist within graphs. And so that kind of leads you to conclude that there might be a, a, a generalized way of thinking about how elementary particles might work, which is just that there are any uh, sort of localized topological obstructions that exist within a, w within a network. And so there's a, there's a grand generalization of Kuratowski's theorem, which is kind of one of the, the big results of modern combinatorics, which is what's called the Seymour-Robertson theorem. And what it says is that uh, effectively there are all kinds of um, instances of rules that you could apply to a graph that will preserve certain features of that graph, and they will lead to these persistent localized topological obstructions. And so our current formulation of particles is that they are these persistent localized topological obstructions, that in effect they are little uh, you know, irreducible tangles that appear in the network that just propagate around and interact with other tangles, uh, but which aren't ever created or destroyed by the action of the rules alone. And so we, as I say, we have these very toy models where we can look at, you know, how particles and how, how particles move and how they interact with each other. And we can even start to construct kind of what look like Feynman diagrams for the interactions of these localized topological obstructions. And as I say, eventually, the dream would be that we can write down a fully consistent quantum field theory that describes these particle interactions, and we can actually compute, you know, scattering amplitudes and things like that. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there are maybe five or six big mathematical steps that have to be taken before we can get to that point. But that's that's anyway. That's at least the the rudimentary uh, formulation we have right now. Very interesting. So I see. So you call it embryonic just because you guys have this interesting notion of what could be a particle. But you need to hit these milestones to really convince yourself that they are, in fact, particles in your system. Exactly. So, you know, so we have a bunch of conjectures. So, like, um, you know, there are ways that so given one of these localized topological obstructions, there are ways that you can compute certain quantities. So and, and it's very tempting to say these quantities look like things that we recognize in ordinary physics. So we, we have ways of computing something that looks a bit like angular momentum, that looks a bit like charge, that looks a bit like mass. And so, uh, but we don't actually have any mathematical proof that they are really those quantities. But of course, you know, 
ultimately it would be really awesome if we could find one of these localized topological obstructions and we you know we computed its spin and we computed its charge we computed its mass and it turned out to be the same as that of the electron or something then you know then we might be able to say okay this is this is actually getting kind of exciting now we now we have a reasonable now, now there's a reasonable basis for saying that we might be able to reproduce the standard model um but yeah as i say i think we're we're a little bit away from we're a little bit far away from that if for no reason other than we don't really yet have the mathematical techniques to to um be able to claim confidently that the quantities that we're computing are actually you know charges and masses and spins and things um even though we we, we think they 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 seem to be that you know they, they behave things like spin behave in the way that you expect spin to behave so you you know uh things like the spin statistics theorem the distinction between fermions and bosons um the fact that fermions have an exclusion principle bosons don't all of those things appear to be true when we run simulations uh, but we don't yet have any proof that they're, you know, that that's really how that's really what's happening. Yeah, uh, right. I, I have an interesting follow-up question. I don't know if this will make any sense, but how is emergent phenomena encoded in your, or how would it be encoded in your in, in this in this theory that y'all are working on? Like, in what sense do you mean? Um, I it's guess a lot of emergent phenomena. Right, but I'm saying it. it I don't know if that makes any sense because I, I it, the question just came to me, so I'm I'm just mm. kind of like working it out. Hmm. Um, sort of like in statistical mechanics, you get you get yeah. sort of ensemble behavior. Um, I, I'm wondering how if you know about that, like how I guess is, maybe does this theory have any sense of some small object you start with and then something emerges? I yeah, guess you could like almost think of the effect. hypergraph in that sense. Because, you know, the space emerges from that in some sense. Um, is there anything else, maybe, I guess, Jonathan, that you have some kind of, you know, uh, basic object that you guys start with and then some kind of uh, uh, There's like a something cascade, emerges but, yeah. from that a collection? See, I mean, so I would argue that in some sense, the basically everything about this model is emergent, right? There's almost nothing, you know... Um, in general, one makes the distinction between, you know, emergent behavior versus fundamental behavior, right? Emer fundamental behavior being kind of the underlying mechanics that describe the system and the emergent phenomena being the st kind of the stuff that appears when you have statistically, you know, when you have large statistical numbers of, you know, components that are interacting with the, you know, according, with these, uh, according to these microscopic mechanical principles. Um, in that sense, almost everything we care about in these models is emergent rather than fundamental, right? The fundamental part is just, you know, these very, very simple rewriting rules that we're applying to little pieces of network. But we don't really care about that. I mean, that, that, that doesn't have anything to do with physics. All the kind of physics stuff appears at an emergent scale. So, you know, in, the, in this sense, gravity in our models is an emergent phenomenon. So ordinarily in fundamental physics, you think of gravity as being a fundamental force, because as far as we know, it is. Um, in in the in the context of this model, though, gravity becomes essentially like a statistical property of of hypergraph in bulk. So a bit like how, you know, temperature is a statistical property of matter in bulk. You know, the notion of temperature doesn't exist if you just look at a single molecule. You know, temperature you can't quantize temperature that you don't, you, don't, you don't get sort of temperons. Um, but it, but it's it's a it's a well defined quantity that occurs when you have a statistically large sample of of, of matter, uh, of you know, of elementary particles. Um, in a, in the same way, gravity doesn't exist at the level of a single you know edge or the, uh, a single network node in our models. It it only occurs at a, at a effectively a statistical scale when you have large you know when you when you when you build up uh, statistically large uh, quantities of of, of of hypergraph nodes. And in the same way, you know, gravity isn't really quantizable in our models precisely for this reason because it's not a fundamental phenomenon. It's it, it's something that that only occurs at an emergent scale. And more or less everything else that we've talked about, you know, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, even particle behavior, all of that you can really think of as being emergent behavior of the model. It's not, it's, n none of these things are things that are built in at the level of the rules. They're all things that appear for essentially statistical reasons when you have large numbers of rules being applied to, you know, uh, hypergraphs of, of large extent. Um, I don't know. Yeah. M maybe I misunderstood your question. But, no, no, uh, no. That's actually, that answers you really great. Because, uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff seems... Uh, like most of physics seems like natural emergent phenomena, but you know, the sort of, the sort of typical approach to teaching it or whatever, the way physics students get it is sort of like axiomatic rules. Like this, this stuff is, is, um, I don't know. We're very, I think rarely taught sort of like this kind of flow 
of uh, of emergence, I guess. I think it's interesting also that your um that you know Wolfram's project kind of has gravity come out from you know understanding space rather than particles, where you would kind of think of that in traditional physics in some sense because we you know we as we always think of a particle like an electron as having mass right so you can come down to the small scale but i guess also but yeah it's it's, it's interesting that that is the case in uh wolfram's model where you you kind of play with space to get gravity yeah i mean and, and this is this is often true with quantum gravity theories i mean so um like you know in these other theories that I've mentioned, things like causal dynamical triangulation, causal set theory, etc., um, people generally start off by considering the sort of kinematical properties of space-time long before they worry about particles, um, because it's it's just you know getting the kinematical properties of space-time right is hard enough in itself, and there's a lot of you know interesting consistency checks and things to do at that point, even before you get to particle interactions. I mean, uh, this this uh, model called twister theory that was developed by Roger Penrose, for instance, um, really never, you know, even though it's it's a very beautiful, mathematically elegant model for quantum gravity, never really reached the point of being able to describe particle interactions. It only ever really described kind of, um, you know, the, the, the conformal geometry of space time. At some level, we're kind of still at that point. Um, we're, as I say, we're trying to get beyond that point and we're starting to look at, um, and these kind of more more, more serious uh, interactions with with particle theory and with gauge theories and Yang Mills theories and so on. Uh, but uh, but as I say that that's that's still at a fairly early point of development. But no, yeah, um, Juan, I, I think it's a it's an important point that you make that we generally tend to teach physics in this axiomatic way, and emergent phenomena are largely omitted except in certain areas like statistical mechanics. Um, and I guess the main reason is just well, one is. It's really hard to analyze emergent phenomena. Like the the amount of stuff you can prove mathematically about emergent behavior is quite small, and and, and restricted to very very specialized cases like fluid mechanics. Um, and to, you know to really understand it and analyze it properly, you need large scale computer simulations, right? You have to be able to look at you know what actually happens when I take a million of these components and let them interact. Um, if you try to analyze that from first principles, almost all the time you're going to fail. It's just, you know, the mathematical techniques don't really exist for you to do that reasonably. You have to kind of explicitly simulate what happens. And unfortunately, you know, physics curricula haven't really caught up with that uh, with that approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a good point that you make. Yeah, I think it's also really interesting, um, the fact that Wolfram, you know, you guys don't shy away from using all these computational you know, techniques and things. And that kind of is something that I've always felt was lacking in modern, you know, physics curriculum. You know, we kind of still do a lot of things analytically, you know, unless you're, let's say you're in computational physics research, but it seems like that's kind of the way you need to go in some sense in modern physics. I guess theorists kind of do that as well. Um, but the computational aspects seem to be something that um, – is really nice that you guys are actually exploring because I think that's going to be one of these key factors in actually doing modern physics research at the, you know, really deep theoretical level. Um, uh, I yeah. guess. Yeah. I know. I, I, I think that's, that's completely right. And, and it's interesting in a sense, because and this is more, this is not really a physics point. It's really a sociology point, but like um, co computational methods have been very, very popular and very successful in some areas of physics, like, you know, condensed matter, for instance. In, in modern condensed matter theory, computational simulations, you know, they're necessary, right? You have to do density functional theory if you want to understand what's going on. Um, same with a lot of astrophysics, right? If you want to actually understand galaxy formation, you can't just do it analytically. You have to kind of simulate what's happening. Um, the, the one holdout area, you know, historically has been fundamental physics, has been quantum gravity and, and things like that, where people still basically do everything, you know, all of string theory, most of LQG, most of causal dynamical triangulation, all of that stuff is basically done analytically. And I don't think there's any reason for that to be the case. I think it's just, you know, for various sociological reasons, that's kind of how it's developed. And <clears throat> as I say, it's one, it's one of the last great holdouts. And one of the things that's weird about this project from a sociological point of view is precisely as you say, it's the fact that we're doing fundamental physics, we're doing quantum gravity, but we're doing, in the, we're doing it in this very, in this approach that's very alien to most other people in the field because we're not just doing mathematical analysis. We're also doing these kind of large scale, almost condensed matter like simulations of what's really happening, um, which I think most, a lot of people aren't really used to. Right. 
Um, and I guess uh, just to switch gears a little bit back to um, some of the more fundamental concepts, uh, Jonathan, I wanted to kind of um, expound upon or see how it links in um, – just like fields and let's say, cause we, you know, we were talking a little about quantum field theory and whatnot. Um, and you know, we kind of think of quantum field theory as having these, like, uh, these, these, everything has its own propagating field in, in all space. Right. So I guess I wanted to kind of see, you know, the connection between, you know, the Wolfram model and some of these quantum field theory concepts, like a permeating field in all space. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's that's a tricky one because so we have a we have a preliminary formulation of like what a for instance a gauge field theory would look like um, in the context of one of these models, but it's it is really 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 quite prelim preliminary. So, <clears throat> um, how can I explain this? The basic idea is all right. So in in a modern gauge theory, in a modern, you know, something like a Yang-Mills theory, you have various kind of geometrical structures. You have like a total space, you have a base space, you have a fiber bundle, and then you talk about kind of local gauge invariance with respect to that fiber bundle. And so, so every, um, for, you know, for every fiber that exists in that fiber bundle, there's effectively a different uh, local choice of coordinate basis. And your the, the, the field that occurs in your quantum field theory, that gauge field is really reflecting things about invariance of the laws of physics under different choices of local coordinate basis in that fiber bundle. That's sort of mathematically what's what's really happening when you talk about a field theory. Um, and so we've done a bunch of work. And in, in particular, um, one of the people on our project, Graham Van Goffrier, was really the kind of the, the, the vanguard in leading this, this particular sub project of trying to take those kind of um, concepts of local gauge invariance and gauge fields and try to produce discretized versions of them. And there's a very direct way that you can do that. So you can start from sort of a um, a, a discrete total space. So you could take something like a lattice, just a pure, you know, like a three-dimensional lattice or something, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and you could apply uh, a, a discrete gauge group, which in our case is just a permutation group, so some some finite subgroup of a, a, of a permutation group. So for instance, you could, if you wanted to, um, suppose you want to represent an electromagnetic field of Maxwell type, so that we know has a U1 gauge symmetry, so we want to represent a, a discrete version of the U1 gauge group. Um, so a very, very crude approximation to the U1 gauge group might be just like, uh, so, you know, um, something like C6, the cyclic group on six elements. So, so the, you know, the, we know that the U1 group has this, you know, has this sort of circle uh, Lie group structure. C6 has a kind of hexagonal structure. So we can, tr we can treat that as being a very crude, discrete approximation to U1. So we're basically taking this total space and we are attaching a, U, a, a discrete U1 gauge symmetry, a C6 symmetry to every vertex. So now we have some, some sort of something that looks a bit like a fiber bundle um, where every, every vertex is now a little C6 sort of um, uh, hexagon and, and, they're, and they're now connected to sort of the, the neighboring C6 hexagons. And we can, define a, uh, we can define a discrete analog of a connection, which is just some rule that tells us how we map from an edge in the in the base space to an edge in the total space, and that connection is effectively telling us, therefore, how the vertices in this little C6 hexagon are connected to vertices on all the neighboring C6 hexagons. And so there's there's freedom in how we choose the gauge connection that way. Um, <clears throat> and then what we're doing is we're essentially saying, okay, now for every point in the fiber bundle, for you know for every fiber in that fiber bundle, there exists a, a choice of outgoing edge each outgoing edge corresponding to a different choice of local coordinate basis. And then the property of local gauge invariance becomes the property that the evolution of the system, the causal structure of the system, doesn't care which local coordinate basis you, you chose. So in, in terms of very concrete Wolfram model evolution, what that means is when you think about taking one of these hypergraphs, now considered to be a total space for some gauge theory, and you apply rules to it, in general, there'll be many possible orientations in which you could apply that rule. And there'll be one possible orientation in general, at least one possible orientation for every outgoing hyper edge for every, you know, for each vertex, because you could choose to orient it in a, in a, you could choose to orient the rule in the direction of any one of those outgoing hyper edges. And so if each one of the, if, if that vertex that you're applying the rule on, or the vertex that it's centered on is interpreted as a fiber, and every outgoing hyper edge is now a different choice of local coordinate basis, then local gauge invariance becomes precisely the condition that the causal structure of the evolution doesn't care what the initial orientation of the rule was, or, you know, for, for, for any rule that could be applied anywhere in, the, in that total space. And that gives you an immediate discrete formulation of a gauge field theory. 
um, something a bit like a Yang Mills theory. And so for the for the U1 case, we were even able to to get to the point where we could start computing things like um, well, we didn't quite get to the point where we could compute instanton numbers because that requires calculating second churn numbers, which we don't yet know how to do. But we can compute first churn numbers, which meant that we can compute flu uh, electromagnetic fluxes from Dirac monopoles. So if you if you interpret a, if if you take a, a Dirac monopole uh, in in uh, in the context of one of these one of these rules. Um, which is just a, a sort of a vertex that's surrounded by uh, a, a sort of um, uh, which is surrounded by a collection of these C six hexagons. Then you can compute what's the what's the electromagnetic flux through that uh, through that shell of C six hexagons that's coming from that Dirac monopole. And if we compute it using these techniques, we get the right answer. We get the answer that you expect given the you know g g given the connection that we started from. Uh, okay, sorry, <clears throat> that was an overly mathematical explanation of the of, of what's going on. Let me try and give a more intuitive picture. So. Um, what that's really saying is, because you have freedom of the orientation in which rules get applied, and because each orientation is really a different choice of local coordinate basis for some fiber, uh, those different orientations will constrain the orientations of, of other rules that could be applied in the hypergraph. Because you, at every, as you evolve from one hypergraph to the next, you will always have the constraint that you you want to apply the rules in a way that they don't they, they, they don't overlap. You're applying you know, the maximal non-overlapping set of rule applications. Um, and so for that reason, every time you make a choice of local coordinate bases, it, it constrains the other choices of local coordinate bases around it, because you, you, you're you suddenly, you're, you're constrained in what other orientations you could pick in such a way that you don't have overlaps. And what that means is that any ch any perturbation in the, in the gauge choice, in the choice of local coordinate basis, essentially propagates out to the whole rest of the hypergraph. Because it's it's propagating out in the sense that it's constraining the orientations of all of the other rule applications. It's constraining all the other gauge choices that you could make at other points in in the total space. And that propagation is effectively the propagation of a gauge field effect. And so that's, in a very abstract sense, how you end up in the situation where, one by making a single gauge choice and a single connection choice, you end up with this sort of field effect that propagates out throughout the entire hypergraph. And again, at least in the U1 case, we were able to show it has the same properties as the electromagnetic field. You know, the tempting conclusion would be if we did the same thing for SU2 or SU3, you know, we would get the weak force, we get the strong force, et cetera. We haven't done that yet. It's a bit more complicated to do it in those cases, uh, but, but that's at least our preliminary formulation of how field effects work and how gauge theories work. Really interesting, man. Um, this 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 is a uh, quite an interesting technique that you guys have because it's like you're basically you mess with this model in such a way where you 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 start with these known properties of these certain mathematical frameworks of physics that we you know are are well understood I guess or I guess understood in traditional physics and then finding a way to kind of back engineer in a sense where you're taking this abstraction and trying to figure out the properties that align with these uh, particular areas of known physics already. Um, so it brings me to the question, like, um, I guess, do you, I guess with this technique, do you guys wind up throwing away a lot of different models or, uh, um, I don't know if I should say models, but a lot of different techniques. So you do just kind of, tr you know, follow the, the, um, the, uh, the trail as far as you can and see if you can actually extract all of these, um, uh, uh, um, what would you say, extract um, a matching between these different properties um, of known physics. Like what, I guess what's, I guess to sum it up, what's the way that you guys distinguish between a good pathway and a bad pathway using this type of reasoning? That's a really, really good question because of course, the one thing you want to avoid is just doing essentially curve fitting, right? You you want to avoid the situation where, you know, you have a very very general, very flexible model, and you're just kind of forcing in ideas from physics that you already know. Um, that's kind of that's a bit hopeless because in the end your model is going to have no predictive power. It's going to have no explanatory power. So it's a very good question you ask of how do you avoid getting into that case? Well, I think the basic heuristic that one has to use, and it actually comes on to the point that Juan made about uh, about emergence, is you want to look at the trade off between how, mu how many assumptions did you have to make versus how many conclusions do you get, right? So at every point you're trying to, when you're choosing between a good model and a bad model or a good approach and a bad approach, it's always a good heuristic to say, how much did I put in versus how much do I get out? If I had to assume everything at the start, 
and uh, you know, in order to get what I wanted, then it's kind of probably a bad model because it, it doesn't really have any explanatory power. If I if I could start by assuming only you know maybe one or two really really simple principles, and out of it I get a bunch of really interesting stuff, that's probably a better approach or a better model. And that's the and, and so it, and as I say to, to, to connect it to what Juan was saying, one way you could phrase that is the distinction between a good model and a bad model is that a good model is one where everything that can be emergent is emergent, right? Because you know the, 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 the difference between emergence and kind of non-emergence is that with non-emergence, you have to bake in the rules axiomatically at the beginning. Whereas if you can bake in a very minimal set of rules axiomatically at the beginning and have everything else be emergent, then it's probably a very good, you know, very good model, a very good approach. Um, in a sense, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a scientific oper operationalization of Occam's razor in, in, in philosophy. Um, and so, that's the main thing that we use when, when deciding whether or not what we're doing makes any sense. So like with the, you know, with the, the formulation of gauge theories, right? Um, that sounds very ad hoc and very much like we might have forced it in somehow. But when you strip it back to its essence and you, and you formulate it in terms of, well, as I say, every, if you interpret the hypergraph as a fiber bundle and every vertex is a fiber and every outgoing edge is a different choice of local coordinate basis, then all that we're really saying is that different orientations of rules constrain other possible orientations of rules. And that gives you something like a gauge field effect. That's a very, very simple assumption. And yet from it, we immediately get, you know, the U1, the, the, the S7 to S4 hop vibration. We get the U1 gauge symmetry. We get Dirac monopoles. We get something that does in indeed look like a, a field of Maxwell type. Um, we get, you know, the fact that if we take the total space and we mod out by the gauge group, we get back to the base space. All these nice mathematical and physical features all just kind of emerge from this one very, very simple assumption. So even though it sounds like it's all quite complicated and ad hoc, if you strip it back to its essence, it's really a very simple underlying assumption that gives you all this complexity. And it's in that sense that I'd say this is probably a good approach. Whereas if, if we'd found that, for instance, we had to bake in the properties of the Maxwell field as part of the rules, then I'd probably say this is this is not such a good approach because it's not really explaining anything. We you know we we wouldn't have been able to derive this unless we already knew how Maxwell fields worked, um, and and that that's really the kind of the the high level philosophical heuristic that we use when assessing uh, what approaches to, to to try. You know I, I I think we're we're almost up on time. Maybe we got like ten more minutes, um, ten fifteen more minutes. Uh, I thought we had a little bit more time. Ten fifteen fifteen. It's like almost eight thirty, but uh, oh, damn! <laughs> he's like, oh man, this yeah. is going, this <laughs> is going by hours. so fast. I know, no. Um, okay, but uh, I I wanted to ask a follow up question because it has to kind of do related with what Terrence was talking about, um, and it mm -hmm. kind of I guess stir, like stirred the conversation more to something that's been on my mind lately, which is like constructor theory. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, Deutsch and Maletto and people, right? Right. It does is there any kind of overlap? Uh, you guys think, or are there uh, parallels? That you think between the two? That's a really interesting question. Okay, so so um, Stephen Xerxes and I actually so okay. We, we got invited to this uh, emergent space-time workshop in Arizona uh, last year, and we, we encountered Chiara Maletto there, and we, we ended up having this long conversation about sort of possible connections between what we do and what the, um, what she's been up to in, in, in the context of constructor theory. Um, and we keep meaning to follow up on that, and then somehow none of us ever have, the, you know, ever have any time. But at some point, we would actually like to do a more systematic investigation of that. But yeah, I mean, so the, the basic... Okay, so my understanding of constructor theory is... Um, that you know, the, the idea is that you're talking, you formulate laws of physics not in terms of like equations of motion, but you formulate laws of physics in terms of what classes of transformations are and are not permitted between substrates, right? So like, you know, uh, the, the first law of thermodynamics, one way you could formulate, or, the, or just the laws of thermodynamics in general, you could, one way you can formulate them is you're saying you cannot build a perpetual motion machine of the first kind or of the second kind. And that's really a statement about, it's not really a statement about laws of motion. That's a statement about what kinds of transformations are and are not allowed within our universe. Similarly, you know, the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics tells you another thing about classes of transformations that are disallowed in our universe. You, you can't make, you know, arbitrarily precise observations of anti-commuting observables. Um, and constructor theory is the idea that you could formulate all the fundamental physics in these terms. Now, our 
um, our approach to doing fundamental physics is, is in some ways more aligned with constructor theory than it is with the conventional kind of equations of motion approach. Because when you take one of our, for instance, one of our multi-way systems, um, the, 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 the reachability relation in a multi-way system is, is telling you which transformations between hypergraphs are and are not permitted, right? If you have two hypergraphs and they're connected by a directed path in the multi-way system, that's telling you that there's a, a sequence of, re of rewrites that leads you from one to the other. And if they're disconnected, then, what, then that's effectively constituting a proof that no such sequence of rewrites exist. So when you describe, when you describe the dynamics of our model in terms of multi-way systems and the reachability relation on multi-way systems, uh, you immediately get a theory that is constructor theoretic in nature. And uh, in effect, what we were trying to do in this discussion with Chiara is see if we could actually do some interesting physics in that context. So for instance, Chiara has a bunch of these nice theorems about uh, the so-called totalitarian principle of quantum mechanics and looking at uh, you know, situations in which um, when you have a classical system and a quantum system and they interact, the classical system is always kind of, or the, the quantum system always dominates the classical system. The resulting system is always quantum mechanical. It's never classical. Um, and uh, there's a way that you can kind of formulate that in constructor theory. And we were trying to work out if there was a way to translate that argument into multi-way systems. We, we figured out there was a way to do it, essentially using the fact that if you have Okay, a little bit of technical detail, but when you have two multi-way systems, there are various ways that you can take a tensor product of them. You can take a, what's called a Cartesian product, which is really the classical version, and you can take what's called a Kronecker product, which is really the, the, the quantum mechanical version. And in a sense, what, the, what this constructor theoretic theorem was really saying in the context of multi-way systems was that when you have two multi-way systems, and one is produced by a Cartesian product, and one is produced by a Kronecker product, and then you let them interact, the, the Kronecker product always dominates over the, over the Cartesian product. Um, and uh, so, so I got quite excited about this because it meant that there, was a, that, that, that there was a direct mathematical translation between ideas in constructor theory and ideas to do with multi-way systems. Um, unfortunately, as I say, that, that didn't, beyond that one discussion and some follow-up emails with Chiara, that didn't really extend very far. But at some point, I'd, I'd really like to see if we could write a paper about some, some more in-depth connections between those, between those ideas. So Chiara, if you're watching this, um... Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it's because I, I recently uh, became aware of constructor theory coming into this uh, conversation. Um, there's a great PBS Space Time video on it, if some of you folks are wondering about it. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a great video. Um, but it, it made me think of what you were working on with Wolfram, and I was like, wow, okay. This has some very interesting analogs. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that paper if if uh, if y'all ever end up collaborating. I know academia, it's you know a lot of stuff gets in the way, so it, it's very <laughs> hard to bring uh, academics together. But um, right. Well, I, and, and Ki yeah, Kiara is a very busy person. That's the main. <laughs> that's the main problem for sure. <laughs> I, I did have another question. I, I don't know. So, so I'm sure you're aware of the Nobel Prize, um, the 2021 Nobel Prize. I, I was curious to see that there was one person on that panel um, between Giorgio my, Parisi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was wondering if uh, if Parisi's work kind of maybe somehow impacted what you guys were working on hmm. in any way. So I would say, okay, so um, I would say, per so Giorgio Parisi is, in a sense, it's, it's indirectly impactful in the, in the following way. So a, a lot of, if we wanted to broadly characterize the approach that we're taking here, you, we can we could think of it as being a sort of complex systems approach to fundamental physics, right? So, you know, complex systems theory is, really all about precisely what you, Juan, were, were, were talking about earlier. It's about emergent effects. It's about looking at, I have a bunch of components and they are all, you know, they all have the same microscopic dynamics, but I have a large enough collection of them and suddenly the macroscopic dynamics is radically different from the microscopic dynamics. And, and you know, can I describe mathematically or computationally how these different elements compose and how the, how the macroscopic emergent behavior relates to the microscopic, you know, mechanical behavior. And as I say, our project is very much one that's in the complex systems theory spirit. Uh, Giorgio Parisi has been a great kind of champion of complex systems theory, but you know, in in somewhat different contexts. You know, so I know um, there's a, a old collaborator of mine, Carlo Barbieri, who worked with Parisi, and so I, I know Carlo's work quite well. He's done a lot of work on sort of um, biophysics and 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 looking at sort of complex systems approaches for for understanding stuff like infotaxis in biology and you know you might think that's 
not directly relevant to kind of what's going on in, in, in fundamental physics, but still the, the kind of underlying methods and ideas of looking at how simple components interact and how they build up to the yield complexity, that's incredibly useful and kind of agnostic as to the underlying discipline. It doesn't really care whether you're doing, dealing with, you know, fundamental physics or dealing with biology or dealing with, you know, for instance, atmospheric and climate physics or, you know, these other kinds of areas where, where people like Parisi have been responsible for kind of applying complex systems related methods. So I would say in an indirect sense, yes, he's been great in kind of supporting an ecosystem in which this project now lives, um, even if, you know, his work isn't directly related to kind of what we do. All right. Well, Juan, I guess uh, our time is running again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I feel like we've done this uh, now two times to Jonathan. <laughs> um, Where we well, have a ton of questions right. and we, we never have enough time. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, do we have any closing uh, comments then or anything? Um, look, I mean, maybe I think, I think the stuff that you guys are working on is on this level of, like, um, it, it seems it can – it has the potential to have a lot of interesting um, contributing, um, how would you say, uh, paradigms mm -hmm. um, in physics. So uh, I'm looking forward to to seeing this, uh, you know, develop further. Um, is there is there like any kind of resource that you would point readers to? Um, yeah, I noticed the um, the hands-on uh, thing I kind of wanted to touch on. The hands-on, there was a hands-on version of the Wolfram Physics um, project where you can actually generate your own hypergraphs and stuff, which I think the audience would probably, you know, really get into and think is really cool. Um, is there any cool things you wanted to tell us about that in, in particular with the hands-on uh, project there? Yeah, so great, 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 uh, great point. So, um yeah, if you go to our website, wolframphysics.org, um, there's uh, there's a lot of resources there. So all of our papers, you know, everything we've published, um, all of our kind of intermediate working documents, all of our live streamed and, and recorded conversations and meetings, all that stuff is available there. So if you if you want technical detail, kind of that's that's a, a good place to kind of have it all in one place. Um, in addition to that, we also have all of our code, all of our working notebooks, um, all of our repository functions. You know, all of that is is available and. Uh, comes with a lot of tutorials and documentation, and as as Terence mentioned, this hands-on tutorial, which effectively says, you know, here's how you can take one of our open source functions, like the Wolfram Model Evolution function, and use it to actually produce your own hypergraphs. Um, and so, as long as you have, uh, you don't even need to have Mathematica. You can do this for free in the cloud. Uh, all of it kind of works works fairly seamlessly. So, if you want to have a go at producing your own evolutions, looking at multi-way systems, uh, extracting out interesting, you know, physical data, computing curvatures, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, you you, you can go and, and do that and we have uh, at this point i think close to a thousand functions that are kind of documented and, and freely available uh, for doing analysis for extracting physics for you know all the stuff that we do cool awesome and uh is there any other projects that you wanted to um shout out jonathan before we had have to go here yeah okay so I, I realized before when i when i talked about what was going on i completely neglected to mention experimental implications which of course is quite important for right. physics <laughs> but um uh, so, so I, I will just very quickly shout out two projects that I'm really uh, excited about right now. I, um, I'm partly excited because I happen to be supervising them, but it's not the only reason. But um, so, so one is uh, by by a, a guy uh, uh, Jan Hojnatsky, who's looking at um, essentially dimension perturbations and dimension decay in the early universe. So when you have one of these hypergraphs and you you start from kind of a random initial condition, in general that initial condition will be very high dimensional. It will, it'll have very high hypergraph connectivity. And the rules will kind of have the effect of inducing a phase transition that, that kind of cools it down to a finite dimensional structure. And so and, and that has a bunch of implications for the conformal geometry of space time, for the causal structure. It has implications for the um, for kind of emergence of, of, of galaxies and, and formations of primordial black holes, all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're, we're starting to look now effectively at the, uh, the dynamics of dimension decay and what implications that has on, for instance, temperature fluctuations and density fluctuations in the early universe with the hope of getting like actual cosmological predictions uh, fr from large classes of these models. So, so that's that's something that Jan has been working a lot on. I've been supervising a bit. And, and that's really exciting. That's turned out to be much more exciting than I expected. We're getting some really, really nice data about kind of what what happens to um, to primordial density fluctuations when they're smoothed out by this by this dimension decay, and, and can we make relationships between that and, and kind of inflationary models, those kinds of things? That's one class of experimental predictions that are kind of cosmological. Um, and another is astrophysical implications, and for that, um, I've been working with with this uh, PhD student uh, Joanna Teixeira, um, and she's been looking at specifically what happens when you have 
local uh, dimension perturbations in space-time and what effect they have on essentially um, the trajectories of light rays. So we're familiar in, in ordinary general relativity with the idea that you have gravitational lensing. So if you have a massive object like a galaxy or something, you know, light rays get bent around it. Um, if you take now a, a flat space-time that's homogeneous in dimension and you just perturb it, so you increase the dimension a little bit in one place, what happens to the structure of the light rays? What happens to the structure of the light cones in the vicinity of that region? So Joanna has been doing a combination of like directly simulating these dimension perturbations and their effect on, on the propagation of photons and also looking at kind of can we mathematically analyze what happens to the conformal structure, what happens to the light cone structure where, when, when those dimension perturbations occur. And if, if, that, if, if we can, uh, we've already got a lot of really interesting data there, but it, we're starting to get to the point where we might actually be able to find, you know, we might be able to predict definite astrophysical uh, signals of, you know, small scale dimension perturbations in the deep structure of space time. And again, that's another really exciting place where we might be able to experimentally test some of these ideas. So um, yeah, those are two other projects that I think are really exciting that are kind of making more direct phenomenological um, connections than, than, the, than the ones I mentioned earlier. Awesome, Jonathan. Well, we greatly appreciate uh, you coming out here once again, man. I'm sorry we had to cut it short once again. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's just always a million questions with this uh, project, man. But, I mean, you guys are doing such interesting things, man. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you're going to have many more uh, interesting things uh, coming out in the future. So, um, yeah. We greatly appreciate it. You having uh, coming here again, man. Yeah. We... Please, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say we might have to catch you on on another early morning podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the t the um the scheduling is is tough. But, yeah, uh, yeah. But but hey, we made I, it happen. At actually, least. this is this is my this can be my new Saturday morning cartoon ritual. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. But we really appreciate you uh, spending time with us uh, and coming on the show again. And I'm I'm sure. Our, our viewers are also happy with with uh, yes with what what was going on here. But exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, so. yeah, th thank you so much for having me on again. It was it was so much fun to be here, and I, I I'm I'm terribly sorry that you guys had to wake up at sort of I don't know six a.m. or something to, to, to make this happen. But um, but I I really appreciate you guys setting this up. This was this was really really even more fun than the first time in some ways. Yeah, well, it's, uh, excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, um, just to close things out, guys, once again, like, share, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to check out eigenbros.com, eigenbros on Twitter, eigenbros Instagram, eigenbros2 on TikTok, and then Patreon, guys. Uh, you know, go ahead and check us out. Support the channel if you like us. Support the channel if you liked what you see with Jonathan. Maybe we can have more stuff like this in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. One more thing, Jonathan. Are there any socials that you want to plug? I, if you want people to bug you or can ask you questions, like personally, like follow up questions or something. Uh, yeah. So probably nowadays, the the easiest way to get in contact with me is is by Twitter. So so you can follow me at, at get John with it. Um, G E T G A O N uh, W I T H I T. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'll if you tweet me or message me there, I'll, I'll generally respond within a day or two. Perfect. Excellent. Well. Thank you again, and uh, we'll see you later. We'll see you later, folks. Bye-bye. See ya.